Thank you for joining us here at the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Michael Penn of the Shingetsu News Agency, and I will be your moderator for today. Uh, as we all know, uh, we're coming up very shortly on the fifth anniversary of, uh, well, a, a, a huge event here in Japan, a triple disaster. Uh, many of us were here on that day, a giant earthquake, and even worse tsunami, and then, of course, the great uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant disaster. And it's in, mainly in relation to the third of, those, of, the thir of the triple disasters that we're going to have our press conference today. Uh, we have three guests uh, sitting here uh, right next to me is uh, Mr. Uh, Kenichi Hasegawa. Uh, Mr. Hasegawa is uh, one of the co-chairs of the Liaison Committee for Organizations of Victims of the nuclear disaster. And uh, uh, parenthetically, he is also uh, a resident of the area. He's from Itate Village, and he's been living in temporary housing for the last five years. Uh, sitting in the middle is uh, Ms. Uh, Ryu, uh, Ry uh, Ruiko Muto, and she is the other co-chair of the same organization. And uh, she also uh, lives in the uh, area, the immediate area around Fukushima. Uh, and uh, a little bit further down, the third of our speakers down there is Mr. Akira Kawasaki. He's Tokyo-based representative of Peace Boat, uh, the very famous uh, NGO uh, that deals with many issues. And at the far, far end of the table there is Mary Joyce, uh, our very talented interpreter. Um, well, uh, a couple of points before we get into the opening. Uh, at the front table there, many of you will notice that there is an English and I believe also Japanese language versions of this uh, book or pamphlet, which uh, you're free to take. Uh, this has been made by a number of different organizations, uh, uh, including a Peace Boat was one of the groups involved in the, in the construction of that. And uh, also, uh, there is a flyer here about an event happening tomorrow. Apparently in Hibiya Park, there will be a very large uh, demonstration in, in relation to these issues. I now turn it over to our first uh, speaker, who will just be giving us an introduction, and that's uh, Mr. Akira Kawasaki, uh, please. Thank you very much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are here to present civil society's views on the reality and the lessons of Fukushima. This is important particularly because the government, while hailing the success of the so-called recovery process, has neglected the needs and livelihood of the people affected by the disaster. And the voices of the victims has been largely marginalized. We cannot let this go. I represent the civil society organization Peace Boat and the Fukushima Booklet Committee. Last March, the committee launched a booklet called 10 Lessons of Fukushima on the occasion of third UN World Conference on uh, Disaster Risk Reduction uh, held in Sendai. We made this booklet as we saw the Japanese and many other governments trying to avoid the inconvenient truth about Fukushima disaster in their discussion on disaster risk reduction. Based on the experience and testimony of local people, we outlined the reality of the Fukushima disaster and put forward lessons to share with the citizens of countries with nuclear power plants and with plans to build nuclear power plants. We, we focus on how a nuclear disaster affects people's livelihood and destroys communities and drew lessons related to evacuation, access to information, radiation measurement for food, agriculture, and fishing, decontamination, and conditions of workers. The Japanese government and industry are now restarting nuclear power plants and even promoting their export to developing countries. But we, the citizens, want to stop such moves and rather export these lessons to the world. So far, this booklet is, is available in nine languages. We already distributed about 14,000 hard copies, including 4,000 in English, 
1,000 in Korean, and about five to 600 in each of Chinese, Spanish, and French, in, ad in addition to numerous downloads online. We have nine more languages in progress, with a view to next publicizing Hindi, Bengali, and Polish by the end of this month. We hope the message of Fukushima will be well heard so that they can lead to right and safe decisions in nuclear power plants debates. Shamefully, the situation we outlined in this booklet a year ago has little changed. Still today, more than 100,000 people are living in evacuation, yet the government is trying to stop support to their housing and terminate compensation and it is promoting the return policy, including to those places where the contamination has clearly insufficient. Victims have stood up against this. Many of their activities have been somehow fragmented because of the differentiated treatments by the government according to distance from the nuclear plant, administrative district, and other artificial conditions. It was remarkable in this context that Hidanran was formed last May as a broad coalition of groups involved in lawsuits calling for compensation and accountability. It has now 25,000 members representing, uh, representing 21 organizations, not only from Fukushima, uh, but also from all over Japan. And it is holding a major scale rally uh, in Hibiya tomorrow. This morning's two main speakers are the leaders of Hidanren. Those are also the ones who are worked with in efforts to share Fukushima's voices around the world. Mr. Hasegawa has spoken in many countries, such as in Korea, Australia, as well as at the European Parliament, warning how the people of Idate village have been affected and how deceptive the governments and officials have been in addressing the issue. Ms. Muto organized uh, various local actions, including legal proceedings to bring TEPCO executives to justice, which resulted in a criminal prosecution just yesterday, which was an overdue success. Now, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> turn the microphone to them. So first, Mr. Hasegawa, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as has been introduced, I am one of the co-representatives of the coalition, which is uh, of various organizations of people affected by the nuclear disaster who are working on legal actions and also alternative dispute resolution in regards to the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. And we have formed into a coalition which is known uh, as the Liaison Committee for Organizations of Victims of the Nuclear Disaster. And the reason that we decided to form this coalition is that while there were various independent uh, legal actions or ADR efforts undergoing uh, throughout Japan, unfortunately there was originally uh, not many horizontal coordination or connections between different groups involved in such actions. And of course people involved in these various actions or raising their voices are doing so from different positions and backgrounds, but I personally am involved in this as one of those people very directly affected by the accident. I am myself from the village of Itate in Fukushima Prefecture. However, currently I am living in temporary housing facility set up in Date City, which is located next to Fukushima City. Prior to the disaster, I was a dairy farmer with 50 cows, and I was also living with eight people in my family, so four generations living together in the one household. However, in the evacuation process, our family has been divided, and we are now living in three separate locations. And at the moment, I am the representative of the Itate Village uh, organization of people who are calling for um, corp uh, compensation and so on. So the Villagers Association making claims in regards to the disaster. And so I would like to briefly explain the reason uh, why I have formed and am representing this Itate Village Petition Group for Relief. The reason is this is that the people of my hometown of Itate, despite the fact that they experience a disaster on such a scale, they're very quiet. They are very much not raising their voices in anger about what they are suffering. So our village, despite the fact that we were receiving no benefits or subsidies at all from the nuclear power plant, only radiation came to us. That's the only thing which we were affected by by this disaster. And the village is still extremely contaminated, and even today the villagers are being forced to live in evacuation. 
And so our village is now living with families having been divided, with people being shut in in their temporary housing and evacuation. And we look today at our village and look at the high levels of contamination which are ongoing there and have no idea when we will be able to return to the village or when the contamination will be lifted. So we are living in a situation with extreme unease and this is causing great stress for the villagers. However, despite this situation, the villagers of Itate have traditionally been quite quiet and resisting raising their voices about the situation. However, I've called upon my fellow villagers to say, should we allow this situation to go on as it is? And as a result, having encouraged them to be able to speak out more, I would say that more than half of our village, which has a population of 6,000, are now standing together with me and raising their voices in regards to the situation. However, unfortunately, the national government has made an announcement that it will lift the evacuation orders on Itate village by March of next year. So in March of 2017, the national government has announced that it will be returning the citizens. And so now the villagers all are faced with having to make a judgment and a decision. So now we are all being faced with the decision of having to decide whether to abandon our village or whether to return to the village, despite the fact that the radiation doses in the area are still very high. However, at the moment, uh, I have an extreme distrust in regards to the official announcements of the contamination levels of the dosages in our village. For example, the national government's announces in regards to the dosage in Itate is just in regards to the air dose, and they're announcing this only in microsieverts. However, I believe that one of our greatest concerns in regards to the contamination and doses in our village is that of the soil. And in regards to my own home, actually the area just behind where our home is located is where there is a forest area. And the official stance in regards to this is that the decontamination there has already been finished. And so I did my own sampling of the soil in this area, which would have been declared as already decontaminated. And the result of this sampling was actually 26,000 becquerels per kilogram of the soil behind my house. And when this is calculated per uh, meters squared, this reaches 1.3 million becquerels. The national standards in Japan at the moment in regards to radioactive waste is set at 8,000 becquerels per kilogram. However, if we consider the fact that these materials, which have supposedly already been decontaminated, are at a level of 26,000 becquerels per kilogram, this is three times the national standards. And it is this kind of area where it has, which has such high level um, radiation contamination that the national government is trying to return people and lift the evacuation order by March of next year. And not only this, but the Itate village authorities are also uh, announcing that they will restart schools in the village by April of 2017. So despite this extreme situation, we are now faced with the fact that it's very obvious clearly that the national government is attempting to put a lid on this situation and make it seem like everything is already finished. So I feel that it is our role as villagers to continue to raise our voices about the reality of the situation in regards to the lifting of evacuation, restart of schools, and so on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Ruiko Muto. I am also one of the co-representatives of the organization Hidanen. One of the primary reasons for which we decided to launch the organization Hidanen was that the fact of, as time was passing since the disaster had occurred, the TEPCO and the national government were expressing no regret in regards to what was happening, making insufficient efforts for relief for those people who were affected by the disaster, not uh, making efforts to conduct full management for children's health. And so faced with this reality, we felt that it was necessary for people directly affected by the disaster themselves to link up, to connect together and raise their voices. Uh, since the launch of the organization, we have been conducting monthly meetings or study sessions and where we uh, share all of the different issues and challenges being faced by people affected by the disaster and come together to form common uh, appeals or common demands to push against the government. In July and October of last year, we conducted uh, large public gatherings and also demonstrations and uh, directly conveyed our demands and requests to the Fukushima government. Unfortunately, however, the Fukushima prefectural government and those responsible within the government, such as the governor and deputy, have made no efforts to actually meet with us to hear our demands, and they are pushing the responsibility elsewhere. Tomorrow, we will be uh, conveying three emergency or urgent appeals to the national government of Japan. One is in regards to the free housing available for people affected by the disaster. Until now, those who have been evacuated or affected by the disaster have been able to live in uh, free housing to, uh, provided by the government. However, this will be stopped as of March next year. So as of March 2017, uh, the free housing available for those affected by the disaster will be completely cut off. So we are calling for this policy to be withdrawn. Furthermore, we are also calling for this free housing to be provided to those people who are wanting to evacuate even from now as well. 
And the second is in regards to the lifting of the uh, designation of evacuation zones and also the compensation being provided. So we are calling upon the government to uh, continue having the evacuation uh, orders or the zoning in place for those areas where it cannot be proved that the additional dosage is less than one millisievert per year. And the third point is in regards to the uh, support or the law for support for victims of the nuclear disaster, particularly children, which was established in 2012. So this law uh, has a very potential to be a very excellent law and it was passed through the efforts of parliamentarians. However, uh, unfortunately, it lacks any concrete contents. Uh, in August of last year, through a cabinet decision, the following sentence was added to the law. And the sentence which was added was saying that those areas other than those which are designated as difficult to return areas do not need to be evacuated. And the final point I would like to share with you is in regards to the Fukushima nuclear disaster plaintiffs uh, lawsuit in which I am involved. And just yesterday, on February the 29th, the three TEPCO executives, that is Chairman Katsumata and Vice Presidents Muto and Takekuro, were indicted in regards to the disaster. So it's now five years since the nuclear power plant disaster, but finally we have reached the stage where there will be criminal proceedings in regards to the responsibility for the nuclear power plant disaster. Uh, this effort was first launched in 2012. At the time, there were 14,000 plaintiffs who were calling for uh, charges to be brought against the TEPCO executives. It has taken this much time, and within these years as well, two, twice, uh, the prosecutors ruled for no indictment to be made in regards to this. However, uh, due to the efforts of the Committee for the Inquest of Prosecution, an independent panel, uh, now the indictment was made yesterday. So TEPCO and the national government have been f hiding facts in regards to the reality of the nuclear power plant disaster and even making it seem that the situation is not even happening. However, due to the citizens' ongoing efforts to call for justice, this is finally being brought to account. And so despite efforts to try and hide the realities or sweep this under the carpet, trying to make sure that we can uphold our responsibility as those people who experience this tragedy and to make sure that this never happens again, that nobody else ever experiences what we were forced to go through, we are going through with these legal activities. So I believe that a fair uh, judgment, a fair verdict will be brought against those who should be brought uh, or held responsible for this disaster. And tomorrow we will be holding a massive gathering and demonstration in regards to this and we will be raising our voices together with other people affected as well. Thank you. Okay, well now we move into the uh, question and answer period. Uh, Mr. Tobari here has just uh, set up the microphone. Uh, so uh, when I call on you, please uh, come to the microphone and give your name and affiliation. We'll beginning to begin today with the working press. So if any working press members have a question, please raise your hand at this time. All right, well, are, are you a foreign correspondent? Yeah, yeah please. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry, I'm very tall. <laughs> um, my name is Arthur Foucher. I'm French from Paris. I'm an independent journalist, but I'm working for TV5 World International News Channel for this report. Um, my question is very simple. Um, about all the evacuees from the beginning of the disaster, how many haven't received yet a comp compensation, financial compensation? Uh, to be honest, I do not have the exact figures in regards to that. This. Uh, however, one point I would like to share is that there are in fact many people, particularly elderly people, who are not able to actually submit their forms uh, calling for compensation, whether it's because of health issues, uh, hard of sight, for example, or they're not able to write and fill in the forms and so on. We have for years been calling upon the authorities to give proper support for these people so that they can submit their, their claims as justified. However, there hasn't been any response to try and implement this. And my other question is, um um, so on March 2007, um, is it an obligation to come back or as Mr. Uh, Mrs. Muto said, is, um, uh, they have two options, they can come back but with the risk to have uh, contamination and just to remove forever from their hometown with the, all the stressful and the psychological uh, impact on their health and mind and so um, if they decide not to come back 
the free housing will stop? Is it correct? Uh, so at the moment, there has been a decision made on the cabinet level for the return to Itata village to be made in March of next year, as mentioned. Uh, however, it's uh, still unclear at the moment exactly how this will be implemented, but it is being uh, expected at the moment that there will be a sort of one-year period in which uh, this move can be done or in which there will maybe still be subsidies available and so on. And I have a last question. Uh, it's about uh, the amount of the compensation. Uh, I read that it was the average was around um, in yen uh, 100,000 per month. Is it per person? And the other question is, is it uh, just for um, what type, what kind of compassion, compassion is it, is it, is it uh, financial or is it, um, um, I don't know how to say in English, like moral, psychological, just the, mm -hmm. to be disturbed by the evacu evacu evacuation or is it to, how can you, is there any other compensation like um, financial ones, like uh, because you lost your, uh, um, business, you know what I mean? The difference between just to be an evacuee as a person and or as a business or as a farmer. Uh, so first of all, in regards to this, yes, we are receiving at the moment a monthly compensation of uh, 100,000 Japanese yen. This is uh, allegedly from TEPCO in regards to the mental damage or mental stress caused by the disaster. However, it does include concrete living expenses for each month. And in regards to compensation provided uh, for people running businesses or shops and so on, for example, I myself was a dairy farmer and I am receiving compensation in regards to this. Uh, however, the way this is calculated is actually the compensation given is equivalent to the profits of that business uh, prior to the disaster. So, for example, if the business did not actually have profits at the time, for example, if it was even uh, in the red, for example, in the time prior to the disaster, then there is no compensation being given for this. So the compensation which we are receiving is uh, corresponding exactly to the profits which were declared by that business. Okay, are there a uh, oh, follow-up comment from? Okay. Uh, uh, I know. But that's you are body masse. Uh, I would like to share my experience in regards to this. Um, I was living in an area 45 kilometers away from the nuclear power plant. However, our town was not designated as an evacuation area. And so this compensation which is provided for uh, psychological stress is not uh, applicable to me, for example, in the situation of where I was from. Uh, there was a one-time compensation I received after the disaster, which was for the amount of 120,000 yen. Uh, this was a one-time only payment. I was also running a cafe, a business, prior to the disaster. However, uh, the cafe was not a very profitable business, and so I'm not receiving any compensation in regards to this either. Okay, uh, I see Fuyuko. Uh, my name is Nishizato from German Television. I would like to ask a question in regards to... I recently went to Fukushima and uh, to cover the situation there within the 50-kilometer area and confirmed, of course, the very high levels of contamination still there. Of course, there was a very different situation for the different areas around the nuclear power plant. For example, Ms. Muto talked about being uh, 45 kilometers away, and we are seeing many people in these areas who have no compensation. Many are still or have been living there since the disaster. Children are still living there and so on in the same situation. However, of course, the difference in situation for people living in the 20 to 30 kilometer areas or those areas which were evacuated is quite disparate. Uh, I would like to ask in regards to the Hidanen Committee, um, do you have various organizations that are from different locations within Fukushima or even outside as well? And I believe it may be quite difficult to coordinate with the different groups depending on where they are from, the situation they are in, uh, how they were affected by the disaster and the compensation and so on. So first of all, I would like to ask in regards to this and also in regards to the situation of Itate, I believe that it uh, is somewhat in a quite unusual position due to where it was located and the effects of the plume and so on there as well. I would like to ask about how this fits in within the picture. Stop. Within these five years, the people of Fukushima have been very much divided. And part of this is due to the different designation of evacuation zones throughout the area, also differences in the amount of compensation provided to people depending on where they are. This has led to unfortunately great amounts of mistrust and also conflicts within the communities. Uh, however, I personally believe that one of the main reasons for this or the reasons behind this is the fact that we did not actually really understand or know the situation of other people, know what kind of suffering they were going through as well. One of the reasons we decided to form Hidanen was a way to bring people within different circumstances and different positions together to find a way for them to understand each other's situation. 
And I believe that if we can, in this way, overcome the differences and the divisions within our communities and connect together, this can form a, a great strength to go forward. And so I would like to respond to the second question, which was in regards to the designation of the evacuation area just as the one... Uh, uh, the set radius around the nuclear power plant. In regards to this, I believe that this designation was complete nonsense, the way that the government went about this. And so, uh, despite the fact that the government has des designated just the direct uh, circle around the area, this is complete nonsense because we know now that the data, for example, from the Speedy supercomputer in regards to where the flume was going and so on, was very clear that the radiation was going towards the northwest of the plant at the time, and yet this data was hidden. And so in regards to Itate, at first, because the designation was made just with this straight circle around the plant, because we were designated as being outside of the 30-kilometer area, we were completely left behind and not included at all within the evacuation. However, because the contamination levels in Itate were so high that they could no longer be hidden, it was one month later that Itate was included within the deliberate evacuation areas. As a result of this, the village of Itate and the people of Itate have experienced the highest levels of exposure to radiation uh, of all of Fukushima. The fact that the evacuation order was not made for a whole month after the nuclear disaster, that this order was delayed and this was partly done because the local authorities did not want to have to abandon the village, meant that the people of Itate were exposed to the maximum levels of radiation following the disaster. Okay, any working journalists before we move on to everybody else? Uh, my name is Everton from BBC Brazil. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Hasegawa uh, who and how was, uh, was made the uh, analysis on the soil in your farm? And uh, why do you think the government is lying? Based on what do you, uh, can you say that? Uh, so in regards to the soil analysis, this was conducted by Professor Itonaga at Nihon Daigaku, uh, Nihon University. And in regards to the content of what we had analyzed, this was not only soil, but we also had the radiation levels in uh, cedar trees uh, around our home also measured there. The soil sample was taken uh, for a 30 centimeter amount, so not including the core part of the sample, but the 30 centimeter level. And in regards to the national government response and uh, why I feel very much that the government is lying in regards to this data and so on, I believe that part of this is in relation to the appeal towards the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, those of us who are directly affected by the Fukushima accident are very much concerned or very much against this situation. However, the government is trying to push forward with the Olympics as a way to put the lid on the situation <laughs> and appeal about the fact that, well, Japan is now okay, Japan is now safe. Okay, uh, Joel. Um, I'm going to ask in English. Uh, decontamination is difficult. I, I was in Fukushima Daiichi uh, 10 days ago and, uh, well, it reduced a bit, but not near the reactors. Okay, we have about 5 to 10 sievert inside the reactor, inside. How can we, um, based on that point and on the past, can all, how can we evaluate what has been done as genuine decontamination? On the way to Fukushima Daiichi, we've seen thousands and thousands of bags with all those uh, wasted there. Um, we hear there are three, four, five years uh, uh, life guaranteed, but these bags start to be a little bit old. What is the state of uh, these bags actually? Have you noticed some things uh, that would be worrying? Uh, it, so my question is about what exactly has been, has been done in terms of decontamination, and uh, is it well done or not? Thank you. Hi. Uh, so first of all, in regards to contamination or the decontamination efforts in our village of Itate, uh, these have been undergone or undergoing for three years now. However, they have only reached up to about 50% of the decontamination being complete. The Japanese government has announced that the decontamination of Itate village will be complete by December of this year, but I believe that this is completely impossible. Uh, sorry, to clarify, I mentioned that the decontamination will be finished by December of this year. This is not of the whole of Itate, but this is of the areas which are deliberate evacuation areas. So this does not include the areas which are designated as difficult to return zones. And in regards to the situation of the waste which is being kept in the large plastic bags, uh, we are also being told that these last for around two to three years. Uh, for example, in the bags which are now on my land as well, they have reached uh, five layers of the piles of this band of the waste which is being kept there in our land in Itate. And when this is finished, a large plastic sheet is placed on top of them. 
And so because these large sheets are being placed on top of the bags once they are complete, then we cannot actually see the situation inside and the state which the bags are now in. However, even two years ago, and this was also widely reported on television, we saw the situation uh, where in bags that were not covered, so where they could actually still be seen, we could see weeds coming through the plastic of these uh, bags. And even when we look at those uh, bags which are covered in the large plastic sheets as well and look at the shape of them, when they were first piled up, the shape was very smooth and in very straight lines. However, when we look at the shape of the same places, we can see they're very bumpy and uneven now as well. So, of course, we don't know the actual situation of what's going on or what the state of what's being kept in those bags is, but we can see that there are these uh, worrying changes going on and there is some kind of effect in regards to what is inside. Okay, uh, I'm going to open up, I guess, now. Mr. Fujita, you've been patient, so thank you. Uh, my name is Hiroi Kujita, uh, independent, and write for Yukon Fuji. So I personally believe that the situation is a tragedy, but the reason for this is I actually am personally of the belief that I don't think evacuation was necessary. Um, if we look at the different cancer rates, for example, which can be caused uh, for uh, having beer or uh, cigarettes and so on, we can also see uh, that there is various risks involved in there. So I do not believe the risk of the low-dose radiation was so high that it uh, necess necessitated evacuation or decontamination. So, of course, I believe what happened to you is a tragedy, but I don't believe that evacuation... Uh, should have happened, and I don't believe that low-dose radiation is a risk. Please comment. Uh, of course, there are people with many different opinions. You will find some people who believe that 10 microsieverts is dangerous. You will find people who believe that one millisievert is safe. However, it is clear that, of course, we do not yet know everything there is to be known about the effects of low-dose radiation. Therefore, I think that and when we consider our everyday situation as well, it is very important to take precautions for the worst case and in, for what might happen because of the fact that we are not still aware of the full uh, impacts of radiation. And this is actually, I think, part of what has led to the reality which we are in now as well, the fact that there is so much not known and not understood about radiation. When we look at the results of the thyroid tests being carried out on children in Fukushima, we can see now 166 cases of uh, uh, clarified or suspected cancer. Of course, we cannot yet clearly say that they are definitely an effect of the nuclear power plant disaster. However, I believe that we have the responsibility to protect the lives and the future of the children, and therefore working upon the precautionary principle is vital. Therefore, I personally believe that evacuation was necessary. Okay, well, let us thank our three guests for coming here today and giving us their insights. Uh, for those of you journalists who want to follow up with them, they will stay a couple of minutes to exchange business cards with you. Thank you very much for coming, and see you at the next event. Hi, I'm Johnny Engineer Turmel, running for Prime Minister of Canada in the 2011 election, and I'm here to tell you why low-level radiation is so dangerous. When you hear them say on TV, oh, low-level radiation, not dangerous, they're lying. Now you got to know why it's dangerous, what to do about it. Deadly deceit, low-level radiation, high-level cover-up, J.M. Gould, Benjamin A. Goldman. This is the overview I'm going to read. Radiation released by nuclear technologies has had a fearsome effect on the environment and human health. Since the atomic bomb attacks on Japan in 1945, considerable research has focused on the health effects of radiation. Early studies examined the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Subsequent laboratory experiments studied analogous kinds of whole body irradiation. The conventional wisdom from this substantial body of research is that high doses of radiation caused by bomb blasts can seriously injure human health, but that small doses of radioactive fallout, often called low-level radiation, do little harm. There is now reason to fear that low-level radiation from fallout and from nuclear reactors may have done far more damage to humans and other living things than previously thought, and that the continued operation of civilian and military nuclear reactors may do irreversible harm to future generations as well. Already may be too late. The chief findings in this book revolve around statistical estimates of excess deaths that have never been been part of the public debate on the dangers of low-level radiation. They may shock the general reader because there has been a sustained effort to withhold official data 
from the public, nuclear physicists realized as early as 1943 that fission products released into the atmosphere could enter the food chain and when ingested could accelerate the deaths of millions of persons worldwide. As related in Chapter 7, Linus Pauling and Andrei Sakharov calculated in 1958 that millions of people would die prematurely from the ingestion of fission products resulting from fallout from atmospheric bomb tests. Today we're in a position to review the official U.S. mortality statistics for nearly nine decades of the 20th century to find that the chilling predictions of Pauling and Sakharov may have been fulfilled not only during the period of atmospheric bomb tests, but after every major accidental release of nuclear fission products. Most previous studies of the health effects of low-level radiation were based on theoretical extrapolations of how many cancer deaths can be expected from exposure to high-level radiation, taken from the experience of Hiroshima and Nagasaki victims. In this book, we take a completely different pragmatic approach. Guided by the pioneering work of radiation physicist Ernest Sternglass and physician and epidemiologist Carl Johnson, we analyze the mortality data collected from official death certificates filed in the wake of large radiation fallouts. In this way, we can estimate the dose response to low-level radiation after the fact rather than a matter of a theoretical speculation. As statisticians, we define an excess number of deaths at any time and place as the difference between the number of deaths actually observed and the number that would be expected based on national norms. When that difference is too great to be attributed to chance, we have found that releases of low-level radiation from nuclear power and weapons plant reactors have consistently been followed by large numbers of excess deaths. Sort of like when Roosevelt banned all the community currencies during the Great Depression and there were 7 million excess deaths over the, what was expected. Radiation from the April 26, 1986 Chernobyl disaster, which reached the U.S. early in May, okay, a week later, was followed almost immediately by an extraordinary force of mortality amounting to perhaps 40,000 excess deaths in the summer months, especially in the month of May. The acceleration in deaths particularly affected the very young, the very old, and those suffering from infectious diseases such as AIDS, suggesting that the ingestion of Chernobyl fission products had an immediate adverse impact on those with vulnerable immune systems. The Chernobyl disaster released so large a volume of fission products into the atmosphere so quickly that its immediate effects, though thousands of miles from the source, were revealed by the analysis of the official monthly mortality reports of two nations that make such data publicly available, the U.S. and West Germany. Our results were unexpected, but when we went back to examine the mortality data associated with previous large nuclear releases, we found the same pattern of excess deaths among the very young and very old. We found immediate increases in infant mortality and in total deaths, primarily comprising older persons, which were followed later by annual increases in excess cancer deaths. These excess deaths may be linked to damaged immune systems from the ingestion of fission products, in particular radioactive iodine, which damages fetal thyroids, and radio radioactive strontium, which concentrates in the bone marrow. This book can be viewed as an epidemiological whodunit with the suspect revealed by Chernobyl in 1986 and the web of circumstantial evidence traced back to 1945. One notable use of our related databases was a report by Greenpeace USA that demonstrated the toxicity of the Mississippi River. Greenpeace found that from 1968 to 1983, there were some 66,000 excess deaths in the counties bordering the river, a figure greater than the number of Americans who died in the Vietnam War. In this book, we found similar disturbing clusters of excess deaths associated with radiation releases. A sampling follows. Between 50,000 and 100,000 excess deaths occurred after releases from accidents at the Savannah River Nuclear Weapons Facility in 1970 and again at Three Mile Island in 1979. 
<clears throat> the 1970s Savannah River reactor rod meltdowns were revealed in congressional hearings uh, after 18 years of official concealment. 100,000 people died, and they hit it. The government claims that no radiation was released as a result of the accident. Yet, because the Savannah River facility is under military control, accurate emissions data are not publicly available. The significant increases in excess deaths suggest a substantial release may in fact have occurred. The Brookhaven National Laboratory has documented hundreds, if not thousands, of routine and accidental civilian reactor releases since the mid-60s, the largest of which occurred at Three Mile Island in 1979. As in the Savannah River case, excess infant deaths from birth defects increased significantly after the Three Mile Island accident, as did excess deaths from child cancer, lung cancer, heart diseases, and other causes. Chapter 6 provides evidence of official concealment and falsification of key data on radiation and its health effects, indicating why these findings have never been made public before. We believe that the cumulative magnitude of atmospheric nuclear weapons testing may explain what has hitherto been a great epidemiological mystery. In the 1950 to 1965 period, mortality statistics inexplicably stopped getting better. After decades of improvement going back to the discovery of antisepsis early in the 19th century. During this period, the volume of fission products released into the atmosphere was equivalent to the explosion of some 40,000 Hiroshima bombs. This terrifying figure was known to the leaders of the Soviet Union, who were responsible for two thirds of the total yield, most of which occurred in 61 and 62, and to Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy. Although the magnitude of the nuclear orgy was not publicized at the time, it led to the U.S.-Soviet agreement to ban atmospheric bomb tests in 1963, after which mortality rates resumed their annual, though somewhat diminished, improvement. Kennedy Khrushchev, good boy. Many members of the baby boom generation who were born into the nuclear age sustained an observable degree of immune system damage. The successive cohorts of persons born since 1945 who were exposed to ingestion, ingested fission products in utero at birth or in early childhood are now registering ominous increases in their mortality rates. That's my generation. These generations are disproportionately affected by a wide range of immune deficiency diseases, including AIDS, chronic Epstein-Barr virus, known as yuppie influenza, or chronic fatigue syndrome, and many others. The heretical hypothesis, first advanced by radiation physicists Ernest Sternglass and, and Jen Shear, that may explain why AIDS first emerged in wetlands Africa in 1980. These areas of high rainfall received the highest fallout during the years of atmospheric bomb tests. They didn't do it near to the states of Russia, they did it near to Africa. In our effort to investigate this epidemic at the local level, we found that publication of cancer mortality data by township routinely available from the Connecticut Department of Health and Services since the 1930s was terminated in 1977. We think that post-1976 mortality and morbidity data for the towns close to Millstone reactors may also throw light on the outbreak of Lyme disease first reported in the area near Millstone during the fall of 1975. An equally startling hypothesis is posed in Chapter 8, where we suggest that fresh milk from dairy farms near nuclear reactors may have contributed, along with the increased poverty and other causes, to deteriorating infant mortality in certain urban areas over the past two decades. This hypothesis was suggested to us by statistics related to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's unprecedented closing of the Peach Bottom reactors on the border of Pennsylvania and Maryland on March 31, 1987 because of operator negligence going back to 1974, 13 years before they were shut down. The reactors had a long record of excessive releases of short-lived radioactive element iodine-131. The Peach Bottom reactors are located in one of the nation's most productive dairy farming areas, which supplies fresh milk to the entire mid-Atlantic area, including the citizens of Baltimore and Washington, D.C. After Peach Bottom was closed in the summer of 87, infant mortality in Washington, D.C. plunged to the best rates in some 20 years. This evidence suggests that the dose response is supralinear rather than linear, 
which means that infant mortality rises more rapidly at low doses. Low level radiation may be more dangerous than high level radiation. Another example of the supralinear relationship was offered in the wake of Chernobyl. The June 1986 increase in infant deaths over June 1985 in the U.S. was a full 10% of the increase in West Germany's Baden-Württemberg province, even though U.S. radiation levels were only 1 one-hundredth to 1 one-thousandth as great. So you take the square root of the hundred, and whoa, it's 10. So you would have expected a lot more, a hundred times more dead people in Germany, and you only had 10 times more. This crucial evidence supports the 1972 laboratory findings of Dr. Abram Petkow, a Canadian radiation biologist, on the dangerous effects of free radicals created by exposure to low-level radiation. Free radicals are charged particles that can penetrate and destroy the blood cells of the immune system, especially at low levels of radiation. Our findings of a supralinear effect also agree with similar findings for cancer mortality from exposures to low-level radiation made by four eminent authorities. All four scientists worked at various times for the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission or Department of Energy. All four concluded that the dose-response relationship was supralinear, which means that there is no level of radiation low enough to be deemed safe. The government terminated the services of all four when they each independently came up with what Dr. Goffman has called the wrong answer. That is, the opposite of what the AEC wanted to hear. The superlinear dose response, more dangerous at low level, for infant mortality may apply to all deaths from immune system damage caused by radiation-induced free radicals, the so-called pet cow effect, that without fundamental change, the death rates of all age groups will begin to rise in the 21st century, canceling out previous advances in longevity. The statistical probability is less than one in a million that during the summer following the Chernobyl accident, the excess deaths observed in the U.S. were due to chance. Equally improbable were the excess deaths observed in West Germany during the same period, and as related in Chapter 3, ornithologist David DeSanti found at the same time that the number of newly hatched land birds counted by the Point Rise Bird Observatory in California in the late spring and summer of 1986 dropped 62% below the average of the previous decade. This book is a challenge to the scientific community to identify plausible alternative explanations. There are none for a million to one shot. The charges made here are too important to be left to experts for resolution. Continued reliance on nuclear technologies may pose an ongoing threat to life on Earth. The potential danger warrants the widest possible audience and public debate. So, this book was written in 1991, 20 years ago, and nothing has been done. Well, that was it. It's all downhill from here, bud. 